Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters, both new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. The Soulful Hunter podcast is also proudly presented by TNK Hunting Gear. If you haven't heard about TNK, then it's about time you do. I've been using TNK gear out in the field and on hunts and have fallen in love with their stuff. TNK is veteran owned and 100% made in America using only American made products. All their gear is covered under a lifetime warranty with no questions asked. If it breaks or fails, they will fix it or replace it for free. TNK is your resource for bino harnesses, bow slings, and a lot more amazing gear. For more information about TNK hunting gear, go to tnkhunting.com. Or search for them on Facebook and Instagram. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Freedom on and stay soulful. The Soulful Hunter podcast is also proudly presented by the Crazy Elk Company. Based out of the state of Washington with products made in America, they are providing solutions with gear to problems you didn't even know you had. Their tag wall is one of those solutions and I had the pleasure of using it on all of my hunts this last year. And it is now a mainstay in my kill kit. The tag wall is a water-resistant zippered pouch that comes with its own reusable zip ties to safely and securely store your notch tag for quick and easy access. For more information, go to crazyelkcompany.com and use the code SOULFUL with a capital S to save 20% at checkout. Be blessed, everyone, and as always, stay soulful. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. Today, I got an absolute legend within the hunting industry and the hunting world. And if you have never heard the name Donnie Vincent, well, you're about to have your eyes opened and maybe you've been living under a rock for the last couple of years. Uh, my journey as a hunter was also partly inspired by what Donnie has been doing and creating and, and just living throughout this life. Um, I actually quoted him in my book that will be coming out at some point when I decide to actually publish it. But he his his most famous quote that I that really stuck with me is to experience fantastic things, you have to put yourself in fantastic places. And that was one of the most like like landmark things that could ever be said for me, because you know that this podcast is all about transforming lives through primal adventure and putting yourself out there. So without further ado, the man himself, Donnie Vincent, thank you so much, Donnie, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's quite an introduction. I don't know how much of a legend I am outside of my mother's eyes, but yes, I appreciate it very much. It's exciting to, to talk with you again. I love it. Yeah, it is. Uh, well, I'll tell you, it is amazing and humility is extremely important. It is always fun to talk to people who, whether you watch on TV or you read about in magazines or you see their their social medias and you follow along with the journey that when you actually get that face-to-face time like what we're doing now or where we get to talk, um, I don't really, I'm not personally starstruck, but when someone said, hey, who's the number one person you want to get on your podcast? I was like, without question, Donnie Vincent. Ah, cool, man. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. That's right, Adam. Stoked to be here. Yeah. yeah. So, Donnie, uh, just first off, the, when we talked back at the Hunt Expo and we were chatting a little bit, you shared with me that you were not raised a hunter. And that, that paralleled very closely with my story. And I am drawn personally to people who want to take on the adventure, want to take on what hunting is all about at an age without someone teaching them and showing them. I think there's a lot of courage and a lot of life skills that, that are extruded by that. So tell the listeners a little bit about how Donnie Vincent got to start in hunting. And then we're going to, we're going to go from there. Yeah, man, it's kind of weird because I, I do, I, I I tell people that I didn't grow up in a hunting family and, and, and really I didn't, but I also make mention that my father, he owned the kit of a hunter. So we had, um, I have it at, at my house now, but he had a, you know, a walnut gun case with, with all the essential kind of hunting guns and, you know, a 12 gauge shotgun, a uh, semi-automatic, a single shot, 12 gauge, a, a 243 bolt action rifle, all these kind of staple guns that you would have. And he had, 
I remember occasionally once a year or something, he'd pull at the bottom drawer open and he'd show me his hunting knives, which never, ever touched an animal. Like these things were just pristine. And he just, he had the kid of a hunter and, and probably the most impactful thing that he had um, was his parents, my grandparents bought him a book subscription to Outdoor Life uh, when he was a boy. And so once a month or once every two months, he would get up. Uh, a book about hunting or a book about fishing and and um and so he had a a bookcase we had a bookcase in the house that was full of these books and i would read them nonstop. and i would page through them i would look at their photos i would read them it was it was uh terribly inspiring and so w- i never really hunted with my father he took me maybe once a year once every two years squirrel hunting where we would just literally we had some sort of orange on a vest on, some sort of boot on, and we would go for a walk in the woods. Uh, that was the extent of it. And so hunting to me was something that lived in those pages, lived in those paintings that were in the book, lived in those pencil sketches, lived in those. And so one of the books that was most inspiring to me was um, penned by Jack O'Connor called The Big Game Animals of North America. And in that, you'd open the book. It was a massive hardcover book. You'd open it. And had it, he'd have a beautiful landscape painted, and it was a hunting scene. So the very first animal is doll sheep in the book, and you can see doll sheep standing on this on this um, granite slope, and and up in the cliffs above them, you can see these little hunters are painted, and you can see guys in like flannel shirts kind of peeking over the ridge down at these rams, and and those pictures. And then as you turned, he would start to kind of tell his history of hunting these animals, and he'd have these little pencil sketches that lived on the subsequent pages in that chapter. And they were, that's what hunting was to me. These big adventures, these pencil sketches, these things, his words, how you describe the animals. And then at the end of every section, he'd go over the natural history of the animal. So instantly I started getting ingrained with biology. Not only was this animal, and he used this term, I loved the term back then, I hate the term now. He would talk about the trophy, he would talk about the quality of agent of the animals that he was hunting. It was very inspiring to me. Um, and then he would talk about the animals themselves, you know, how they lived, where they lived, what, what, and so that really inspired me. Um, and, and, you know, so I, and I recently was talking to my mother about this and she had told me that my grandfather, her dad used to travel out West and hunt for, uh, antelope and mule deer. And she said for the longest time in their house, they had a lot of kids and, and a big family and a little house, but she said uh, for the uh, longest time in their house, none of the kids really understood that you could even buy meat at the grocery store. She said we were eating squirrels and rabbits and snapping turtles and and deer and, and antelope and all these different things. And that was her dad who, and he died before I was even born. And then my dad's dad was a big fisherman and he loved to hunt. But as the story goes, most of the time that he traveled and hunted, he did so without bullets. Um, apparently, he's legendary for grabbing a gun, no bullets, <laughs> and just walking around the woods because he loved to be with nature and he didn't want the responsibility of having to shoot anything ever. So he never brought bullets, um, which is really funny because when I think about those two grandfathers and you mash them together, you kind of get me. Yeah. And um, and so it wasn't until high school that I actually started you know, really venturing out on my own, really starting to look at the animals, how they moved, how they functioned, why they were here, where they were going. And it started with ducks, then it went to deer. And then obviously it's just kind of picked up and yeah, now it's, now it's my life. Good, bad or indifferent. Yeah. And quite a life that you're living. I love uh, to go back to that quote that I opened the show with, but I would, I imagine you saw these amazing pictures painted within this magazine or this book, and you were like, I want to experience that. So yeah. how, how do I go about experiencing that? Is That's that, exactly that. And so here you are. And, and so every time you go out on a hunt or you're going out on these adventures, do you constantly have like this reflection of Jack O'Connor's books in your mind? And like, hey, I want this. Not, to- that's exactly right. Not, not only do I have this constant reminder, I will go back very, very often 
you know, like um, two years ago or three years ago, I went to Tiburon Island in Mexico and, and um, hunted desert sheep. Well, I went back to all my old books and read every word that I had on desert sheep from Jack. And so, you know, it meant something to me when I read it the first time, but it really spoke to me when I read it prior to going hunting. And then again, once when I got home, I read it again. And, you know, now that I'd experienced it. And so, yeah, it's a constant, it's a constant uh, inspiration. So what was it when you were in high school that like was the final, I got to go get after this. I need to learn how to hunt. I need to teach myself how to hunt and, and go down this, this, you know, passion. Uh, 100%. It was about seeing the animals. So duck hunting for me was, um, I, I shouldn't say 100%. There, there's a big part of it. That was the hunting gear the hunting preparation, buying, you know, buying a shotgun, incredibly exciting day, going to the gun store and looking at all the guns and feeling them and the weight of them and the balance and how they point and trying to come up with some sort of, you know, opinion in your head, even though I've never really gun hunted, but coming up, you know, sitting there in a store going, oh yeah, this one feels good. Well, how would I know? But it's still a fun process and getting all the gear together and the decoys and Um, training your dog and doing the best you could to train your dog, duck boats, things like that. Um, So that was one aspect of it that was really attractive to me. But the other aspect is really seeing these animals, going to the places where they live, getting in a truck, loading your gear in the truck, maybe a buddy, and driving to northern Minnesota and going to Thief Lake because I wanted to hunt bluebills in a traditional fashion. I wanted to see foggy mornings. I wanted to see big snowflakes falling into cold white caps and I wanted to see these fat little fast ducks turning, cupping their wings and pitching into the decoys, you know, and I'd read these words, I'd see these images, and then I'd want to just chase these things down. And and um and that was really what it was all about. I didn't really understand the food. It was fun to eat these things when we were done and it was always kind of an epiphany. You know, we'd kill a duck, we'd clean it, we'd cook it and be and then, you know, you kind of look at your body like, hey, we did this. Like, we're eating our food. Like, right. we did this. Yeah, but I never really, like, the heaviness of taking a life came from the more and more I did it, the older I became, maybe the wiser or more um, retrospective, you know, the more I thought about, the more I internalized it. Then I started to realize that, you know, there's an aspect of being a hunter that is being an executioner, Right. These animals don't die unless I pull the trigger, release the string, whatever it is. And so then I started to realize that I had a very active role in response in the responsibility of killing the animals, a very active role in being responsible for my actions. And and uh, so then then the food started to taste even sweeter. And then, you know, and it's just compounded from there. Man, you know, as you're talking and sharing these stories and your perspective with me, I can't help but notice that you are an extremely creative person. You talk in a very, a very artistic way. The way you see hmm. things, the way you are um, like observing and portraying it. I really love it. And I think this is probably, I could only imagine that's what led you into filmmaking as well. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well that I, I and thank you. I appreciate that. That is, um, that's how I want to live my life like that. I, I'm not doing, I don't want to project this um, so that you read me in a certain manner. This is just how I want to live my life. I want to look at things in the tiniest of detail so that I'm, if I can be easily entertained in the outside world and, and even, even around people and, and um, reading a book, being at a party, like driving a car, you know, so, sometimes the littlest things catch me. Like get if if you're in the wilderness for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and then you get in a car afterwards, and suddenly you don't have to walk to where you're going, and you can turn the radio on, and music comes out of the radio. Like those little things, like I, they are not lost on me. And so, this is how I kind of live my life. So I appreciate you saying that. But um, yes, just kind of, it's um, you know, filmmaking came from wanting to share a story not become a storyteller but share a story but also again i wanted to see the animals and so when i would come home from the arctic the first time i went to the arctic i came home 
And all my friends want to know about the Arctic. They want to know about the caribou. Did I see grizzly bears? Did I see wolves? What was the weather like? You know, did I see the sun? Was it dark all the time? You know, they're so curious. And so I'm telling all these stories. Well, then I started realizing I need to bring a video camera <laughs> because I am not able to tell you what a herd of caribou walking past is like. Like they were entertained by the stories, but I wanted to show them. Yeah. So then I wanted to see it film it and share with them. You know, I totally, I totally get that. And I'm in the exact same boat. So I'm a father of three children. I got a, a six mm. year old, uh, a four year old and a one and a half year old that oh, they all have. Thank you. That's yeah, man. It's uh life is good. <laughs> the Mac house. Yeah, I is... love kids. I love kids. <laughs> uh, well, I can't wait to get them out with me on my adventures, but a part of why when I started hunting, um, even without being very knowledgeable or successful or however you want to describe it or or uh, value it is every time I came back from these hunts, I'm like, dude, this is the most epic experience of my life. I wish you could have been there. I wish you could have seen the emotions. There was highs of highs, lows of lows. I hated it. I loved it. It made me cry. I was laughing like the gamut of emotions. And yet to come back to a house with little kids that are begging for attention and screaming for different things and constantly touching each other. And that story that I wanted in my heart to tell to my wife, to my children, it wasn't being conveyed very well. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, as time goes on, you start to lose little aspects and the power of stories and, and I was like, okay, I want to start filming my hunts because mm-hmm. I want this to last. You know, a lot of people, yeah. you know, the concept of uh, in what Mayan culture, you die three times, right? The first time you realize mm-hmm. you're going to die, the, t- the time you actually die, and then when your name is finally said for the last time. No one ever mentions yeah. your name. And that's why I'm a yeah. huge fan, and I'm going to be writing a book, or actually I've written it, I just haven't released it yet. But I've also documented my journey because I want to show my children. I want to show my wife. I want to paint a picture for humanity to understand how powerful and life-transforming hunting has been. Mm -hmm. I was raised a a backpacker. I've done multiple miles all over the West Coast, up and down trails. But I was always missing something. When I put that rifle or my that bow in my hand, my life lit up and transformed like nothing, nothing ever could touch. And so how could I go about taking what I was experiencing with passion, with love, with a joy and excitement that's going to spark a fire in someone else's soul? Mm-hmm. And, and film is such a great way to do that. Not everyone wants to read a book, which a book is beautiful, uh, but... You can't always tell people the truth. A lot of times people learn through seeing the truth. Yeah. And portraying that truth of what hunting is and the power that it has uh, through video, through, through the visual. It's incredible. Is is that, I mean, you can hear me light up. This is why it's called the soulful hunter. Mm -hmm. This is literally, there's nothing in my life that has had a greater impact than hunting. And now I yeah. want to share it with the world. I want to reimagine yeah. and reinvent it for everybody. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Is is when you set off on your adventure and you're filming your projects, do, is there something in the back of your head where it's like, okay, I, you do it for yourself for, for the fulfillment in your own soul, but you're like, okay, yep. this one's going to blow people's socks off or I can't wait to get this in front of some yes. people. There's, there's two ways to look at it for me. One is when something sensational happens and you know, my um, director of photography, his name is, is uh, William Altman. And uh, I have a director, Kyle Nicolite uh, works with us at sick man. And he, he's oftentimes picking up a camera as well. And when I look at these guys' photos and, you know, when they're working as photographers and, and pushing through all this stuff, like if something happens, you know, a caribou crossing a river, a bull moose, ripping a tree out of the ground and then crossing the river to us or a you know grizzly bear chasing a caribou calf or you know fish you know one of our favorites i mean i've seen so many things that i 
if you ask me for a top 10, there's no way I could come up with them. But when you're seeing salmon, you know, come up the stream and, and they're making their reds, you know, and they're like splitting their tail and the bucks are there and they're all fighting all of these things. When we're recording them, what, what the, the sensational aspects of my mind is I want to look at the viewfinder and see, like, I can't wait to share this with people. It's not so much the adventure as a whole. It's these little collective images, or sometimes I'll say something on camera. You know, it's difficult to be yourself, right? It's difficult to, if I was an actor and somebody was giving me lines or even telling me to ad lib, and I could, you know, then you have the freedoms of the world. You can be anything you want, or you can be that character, and they don't get to hang that on you, right? I get to play, if, I, if I'm in a movie and I want to play a serial killer, I'm not a serial killer, but I can play that. They can judge the role, but they can't judge me for that character. And so, but this is me that that we're filming, and this is uh, our team that we're filming. And so, um, it's very often these little events with animals themselves, or weather, um, or airplane rides, or boat rides that I want to share with people. And then, if I'm able to strike the right emotion in my own words, if I'm able to evoke how I'm really feeling and seeing things blending those two things together is really exciting to bring to an audience and it's really exciting to me that i'm hoping that our work is good enough or intriguing enough to live on after my death that's that's one of the things that, like you what you spoke to i'm really hoping that you know 10 years after i die 20 years after i die people are still commenting on the films that we've made and still sharing them with their families and uh, much like we are with fred bear's work and and uh, some of the pioneers, some of the yeah authors, things like that. You know, this podcast is really big, and I'm really a staunch proponent of creating a legacy. And a legacy is not just handed down to us. We get to create that each and every moment for ourselves. It's the legacy for yourself. Also, you get to create the legacy, whether it's passing it to children or friends or all that. That is so impactful. But one of the things that I have... I get asked, uh, not, a, not a lot, but a decent amount is, here you are being a newer hunter. Here you are uh, even just hunting. Take, you know, whether I'm new or not, that has nothing to do with it. Does getting, bringing a camera along detract from you being present in the moment? And, 100%. and one of the things that I can't stand, personally, I'm not, I'm not throwing judgment on people because people get to live their own life how they want. However, when you're at a concert and you're in the front row of a concert and you're like, yeah, this is awesome, but you're watching the concert through your cell phone as you're recording it, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of, you know, you're not getting the full experience. And so to immerse yourself in hunting completely, I think there's this, you know, this concept of like hunting's been commercialized too much or even that it's going to take away from your experience because you have a camera or because you're trying to also, uh, do two different things while you're out there you ever experienced that yeah oh yeah yeah this it's a constant right because um there's a couple of things excuse me well the, the biggest attractor are our phones right if we spend time in the wilderness it is proven that it is immense soul food for an individual whether it's an inner city kid that's never been in the wilderness or a lifelong hunter if you get them in the woods and immerse them for three plus days, um, their their test scores start to skyrocket, their cognitive retention, their creativity, their um, probably even I, I, IQs, if, if you were to test them, start to really go up. And I don't know what it is, right? I don't know where they're pulling from their brain. I don't know why they have this sudden clarity or inspiration, but I would imagine it's because their minds have been so busy that they're tapping into their subconscious and their subconscious is able to come up with things that um, having not been occupied by things in their phone or, or, or other distractions that their brains are allowed to breathe and, and actually run with these ideas. And so um, having a camera there and another person or two other people is definitely a detractor. Um, doing things in a particular manner, you know, sometimes like when I'm cutting up a caribou, I would just be skinning a caribou and cutting up a caribou. But if we're filming and I don't mind this, but if we're filming, sometimes I have to stop. We have to grab another lens, switch a lens, put it on a tripod, move it over here. The sun angle is now 
terrible so we have to wait two hours until we cut it up so it looks a little bit more pretty on film things like this and i'm, I'm making up these scenarios but you get my mm -hmm. my you get my drift um you know i've i've had really successful hunts with really mature beautiful animals where when it's all said and done our crew you know william will look at me and go oh we've had rain this whole time and now when we are successful it's bright and sunny and it's all blown out it's just too bright and you know but here we are that's that's when we found success but he's like oh we've had great clouds and rain this whole time this moody weather and now suddenly on the day that we you know shoot the grizzly bear it's full sun right and really bright so um there's elements like that that detract it there's elements of the communication of having your phone or your in reach device that that are detracting but um i kind of try to compartmentalize that stuff and push it away because I want to share it with people. I want to tell these stories. I want to bring these things back. You know, a few years ago, two years ago, I was flying out of Kotzebue, which is a little Eskimo village in Northwestern Alaska. And I don't even know what inspired me to do this because I very rarely do it. But as I was sitting on the tarmac in this village, I went into Instagram and I clicked live. I was just like, I, I don't even know if this is, but I just clicked live and it was like, connection, connection, boop, you're live. I was like, oh, I'm live. And so, you know, I was in a super cub with my friend, Brian Albert, who's the pilot. And I just held my phone up and he just took off and we flew into the wilderness. Like you can see the Brooks range in front of us. You can see the snow capped mountains. You see all the leaves are changing. We're flying over caribou and moose. And I just held my phone. And I was like, I'm just going to let this record as long as it will, because I know I'm going to lose service here in a second. And so I just held it. And, and afterward, I went back and watched it and saw people. Some people were commenting and they and they said, hey, put your phone away. Enjoy yourself. And just much what you just said about the concert. But for me, which is fine, and I completely agree. But for me, I was just holding my phone up and I was still doing my thing. It's just that I had this opportunity and we live in this weird and in my opinion mostly very unattractive world of having cell phones where everyone's connected all the time we can see what we're doing we can shape our lives however we want you can't believe anything anyone says you know it's it's just become a, a bit of a circus right and we're all part of it you're guilty of it i'm guilty of it everyone's guilty of it that has a phone but i just sat there and filmed this and what i thought instantly where my mind goes to is somebody hopefully somebody saw this that either will never come here or can't come here maybe somebody who's on instagram it's quadriplegic or whatever they're 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 at home sick whatever it is and this this maybe brought them some imagery that they could enjoy and watch and so that's where my mind always goes to but i try not to um live i live in that space and time within the phone and and even with the cameras like we try to do things very honestly we always shoot with two shooters because we never recreate footage it's how it happens is how it happens unless like i swear or something like that which <laughs> for sure happens then we'll because i'm not i'm not gonna fall into that you know, you have media these days like Joe Rogan and all these guys, they'll just openly swear because either they don't care or it's cool or whatever. And I just don't want to do that. I don't I don't want like I want your kids to be able to watch our films, yes. you know, and I don't want you to have to be like, oh, at minute at minute thirty five, he says the S word or the F word. And then, you know, which I definitely do say at times. But, yeah, we. Yeah, I totally get it. And, you know, I feel like there is actually a place in language for well executed and well used cuss words. It, you know, the, em I agree. the emphasis is just so powerful. And yet at the same time, know your audience that you're trying to reach. Yeah. And me yeah. being a school teacher, <laughs> specifically middle school, like, I don't want my students swearing in class. And so I know that they could listen to this podcast at any time. And there's, you know, yeah. all sorts of stuff that I also don't want to have to label an explicit label yeah. on my podcast or the work I'm creating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Okay. So when you, what, tell me this transition of you hunting, you became a biologist 
And mm-hmm. then at what point did you say, okay, I want to create a larger impact and actually produce things, uh, whether it's your videos or, or all that? Like, how, how did that go? Oh, I, I'm, I mainly wanted to work in biology. That was where I, I really wanted to live my life, have my contributions. Um, that was very uh, attractive to me at the time until I realized, which didn't take very long, and I don't feel terribly smart <clears throat> admitting it this way right now, but um, as I realized when I, when I started doing field work, I realized right away that all of the people that I worked with, as they worked a year or two or three in field work, were promoted into a desk job. They still did some field work, but for by and large, they were promoted into different aspects of the agencies in which they started working from a desk. So um, I just kind of started to reevaluate things and when I started thinking about this. And um, ultimately, this idea came from someone else. I went on a trip in 2009, I think it was, and uh, a photographer friend of mine, John Hafner, who's an excellent shooter, um, he came with me on a on a doll sheep hunt to the Yukon territories and um, excuse me. And he um, he came and shot photos of this doll sheep hunt that I did and having those photos at the end of the trip. He's a very talented um, shooter. Having those photos at the end of the trip really gave me elements of the trip that. I didn't even really see right now. I'm seeing my own trip through his lens. Now I'm finally getting to see me through my own experiences. I was there. I'm looking through my eyeballs, but now I get to see me looking through my eyeballs. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was was really interesting. And as I got to tell these stories to people, well, here now I had some imagery to actually share with people. And so, um, his photos really kind of gave the inspiration of taking things to the next level. And then, Long story short, uh, a group of wealthy gentlemen approached me. They wanted me to do a TV show on the Outdoor Channel. We were going to go out and traditionally get sponsors, um, you know, Ford and Realtree. And, you know, I'm making these up. But, you know, like we'd get the traditional sponsors and do a TV show. And and I was jazzed about it. I mean, this was a dream come true. They're like, we'll pay for your hunts. You'll have a hunt stipend. Um, you'll have a gear stipend and you'll travel and you'll, you'll put these shows. So I, I you know, they were going to, these gentlemen were going to pay for my hunts. They were going to, uh, you know, I was going to have a gear stipend. I was going to travel around, get this footage, put it on Archie channel. And that's, that's how I was going to do it. But right away, instantly, within a couple of days, I started to just not like the plant, you know, we'd get an offer from a company and they'd say, we want you to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. We'll pay you this, you know? And, and um, so right away, I just, it just started to feel so different to me. It started to feel like I was now starting to create for this company and I wasn't going to be doing sincere filming and telling my stories. And, and it just, it just didn't feel right to me. And then, um, through a series of events, I met some different people, uh, did, you know, started working with them and doing little side projects. And then I ended up meeting, um, William Altman and Kyle Nicolite, um, on one of those projects and then just decided, Hey, I think we can do this. Like Kyle is a very gifted storyteller, very gifted filmmaker, um, out of Nebraska and, and then South Dakota. And he, he came to the, he, he brought the expertise of being able to actually put a film together, editing a piece together. He understood where music fit in and, and uh, he's, he's a genius. And then we had William Altman, who's now the director of photography. And he was very, very talented with the camera and learning quickly. And so, uh, and then I was, you know, to be a piece of the subject matter outside of what is the wilderness and the animals. And, and, um, and I had something to say, you know, I had, I had a voice, I had, had very strong feelings about the wilderness and about wildlife and about people and, and uh, not strong feelings, but um, I was constantly fleshing out these questions, constantly asking myself questions. I had something to say. And so we blended our three talents together and started Sigmanta. And so, you know, we basically met. So I shot with John in 2009. I met these guys in 2011. We started Sigmanta in 2012. I may have met them in 2010, 
started Sick in 2012, and um, we said we'll make one film, which is The River's Divide. We'll make one film, we'll see how it does, and then we'll go from there. And very, very, a lot of people, I'm not going to say everyone, but basically, for the most part, everyone told us there's no way it will work. That, you know, I had industry friends sit down with me and they say, no, 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 here's the deal. You sell your commercials on your out on your TV show. This is how you make your money, X, Y, and Z. Like they said, are you gonna put your films on TV? And I said, No, not not initially, not right away. I'm just gonna sell them. They said, Oh, no one's gonna buy them. You know, this isn't gonna work. And so, um, and a lot of people say, Well, that inspired me to prove them wrong. It didn't. It worried me sick. I was buying into their drivel. And so I was like, oh my God, this is, yeah, they're right. They're for sure they're right. They're right. Like these guys know more than I do. They're right. But other people in my circle, people that knew me in the team that we were working with just said, no, no, they're wrong. Make a film. It will sell. And then see about making a second film. I do. I got to jump in here real quick because you are speaking my language. There is so much. I'm a huge believer in. Uh, speaking the life that you want into existence, manifestation, and you know, vision boards, and really, that you will always find fulfillment and success. And success looks different to a lot of people, but you will always find fulfillment and success when you live the life and create the life that you want. You, yeah. The, the the shoe that society creates. They want it to fit everybody. They want you yeah. to follow yeah. this certain mold and avenue and be like, oh, yeah. well, if you don't go to college, you're not going to get a job and you're not going to be successful. And you're not. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Create yeah. the life you want. And when you actually put your passion and you speak into it, the world's your oyster. And that's why I think maybe I'm so drawn to what you do and what you create and and how you are showing up in the world because Donnie Vincent, it seems, it seems like Donnie, and obviously we've only spoken person the second time now, but this yeah. seems like the Donnie Vincent you see is the Donnie Vincent you get. And what you talked about earlier, you're not just some actor portraying something. And yeah, that's so powerful. And I really want the listeners to understand this, that it is bigger than hunting. This is about yeah. being a human, about being a part of this universe, God's creation, and that we were made to be, I, I'm a believer in God. I, you know, it says <laughs> in the Bible that we are made in the, the image of God. So if God's mm -hmm. the creator, we are then many creators because we were made in his image. So if you're not creating with your life, and this is why I think I talked about the artistic thing earlier on in the episode, is I love how you have inspiration within your soul. I always talk about motivation is extrinsic, uh, inspiration is internal. We, we can fire up and stoke our own fires by living what we want to do. And when we identify what we want to do, the world is our oyster and our souls become on fire. That's, that's right. I, I see people all the time. I, the probably outside of gear um, and questions about where to go or what to do. The biggest question that I get is how do I do what you do? What steps do I need to take? What's the recipe to bake the cake and have a career like yours? And there isn't one. There isn't one. It's really being yourself and really chasing down. There really isn't, I say this, there isn't a job that involves you getting paid to go hunting. That doesn't exist. You know, even if you're a TV personality, you're Jim Shockey, you're Michael Waddell, you're Lee and Tiffany, whoever the, you know, the, it, it appears as though they are being paid to go and hunt. That's not true. They are being paid to peddle products. They are being paid to go to sports shows, to create commercials within their TV shows, to use certain brands um, and to educate hunters on certain techniques. You know, that those are their passions, right? When they're doing seminars or something, that's who they really are. But the rest of it is a business, and, and we have a business as well. We own a production company, Sick Manta. And so, you know, earlier today, we're, I'm working with Kyle, and um, we, do, we shoot a lot of commercials. We shoot all the um, hunting and fishing commercials for Shields Outdoors. 
So we had client meetings this morning with Shields. Yesterday we had client meetings with another different client. And so there's, there's real work that has to be done. I just don't get up every morning, shoot my bow. In fact, I see other people in the industry because I also, unfortunately, am on social media, but I see other people in the industry like I get up, I work out, I shoot my bow every day. I do this and this is like, I don't have time for that. You know, I, I, I get up and work out and I shoot my bow at some point during the day. And, and I, I do X, Y, and Z. Like I'm very, very fortunate to, you know, part of my day is going through my gear and, and shooting rifles and doing all these different things. But, um, there's also real work that has to, that has to go into it. Right. And so, um, that that's, that's, I get asked that a lot. It's like, how can I do what you're doing? And really, if I were to give somebody advice, I said, what should I do? I can't encourage people not to go to college, although I can certainly see a path that doesn't ex involve college. But what I would tell somebody is I would say, cut all your cords that you have, set yourself up for freedom. Even if that means you got to walk away from your girlfriend who you're crazy about for a year or two years or three years and travel, travel and don't just travel to sightsee travel. And this might be, this might mean in your town, go get a job with a car mechanic, go get a job with somebody that cuts trees, go get a job at a farmer, go get a job at an advertising agency, go get a job, you know, working with computers, go do all as many work as a fisherman, do all those things and build your resume of experience. Really pay attention. Look at the tiniest little details. Talk to the fisherman. Why does he fish? How long has he been fishing? Who is a fisherman? What does it mean for him to bring the fish to market and also to his family? What's going on in the ocean? Learn all these little details about the fishermen. Take your paycheck and your knowledge and go on to the next place and get as many experiences and education and, and um, wisdom as you can and then take that to the job market or realize who you are. And, and launch a company or launch a product or um, go work for a company that you find terribly inspiring, but be an asset to them. Everyone, people always want to know how to break into the hunting industry. If you are a talented, driven, intelligent individual, you can walk into the hunting industry. You don't have to break into anything. They will be fighting over you to give you a job. But if you're looking for a re free ride and you just want to shoot your bow and you want to get outside and sleep in a tent, um, you don't need the hunting industry or anyone else to do that. You can just go do that and, and um, you know, just be literally be yourself. It's so difficult to be yourself. It's so, so very difficult to be yourself. And really, that's the secret. Authenticity is like this secret gift, like you said, that people want to ignore. You know, we're we are meant to be in community with people. But more often than not, people like to shield themselves and hide themselves and not give their gift of who they are to the world by trying to portray and fit in with other people. You know, mm -hmm. for the longest time, like just a little history on myself for all you listeners as well have never heard this. Like I was a straight A student growing up, 4.0, honors classes, uh, all these things. But I was also an athlete. I played college football. I played college lacrosse. And so academics and sports worlds often don't mix. They don't intermix. Yeah. You know, the concept of a yeah. jock is a dumb jock. And yeah. a person who's often thought of like in honors classes is like the brainiacs and nerds or whatever. And so people like to classify and, and segregate and put people into boxes. And it's like, no, when you just become who you are, not become when you allow yourself to show up in the world who you are it yeah. becomes that much more fulfilling and not only you may not realize it you're impacting your own self but you're really leaving your mark on society in this world when you are who you are meant to be yeah you you you're making your own box we're still going to be put in boxes being put in boxes does work right we are stereotypes do fit for certain reasons but you can also create your own box to where somebody says, you know what? You remind me a lot of Donnie Vincent, right? I, I can have my own box. I don't have to fit in someone else's box. And so 
it, just like what you said, it's, it's really, really important. Man, it's so cool. Now, you always talk about the Arctic and going on these like spectacular places. What are the hunts that have that you have left to do that really are calling towards your soul, towards your heart? I mean, there are a lot of them. I there are a lot of them, but it's way less sensational than you might think. Um, I don't chase. I'm not chasing like the North American 29. I'm not. Um, I don't want to kill each, each animal with my bow. And and I did have ambitions of doing that at one point. Um, I thought, how cool would it be if we made a film about each species that you can legally hunt with a bow? And so um, I'm not saying I'm not going to do that. I'm just saying it's not a goal of mine right now. Um, the hunts that I really am looking forward to uh, are the simplest of things the big adventures some of them some of them really close to home um but they're the simplest of things i'll give you a for instance next week um i'm i'm again he, here's a good example of what my life is next week i believe on wednesday i'm flying to i'm flying into oakland california i'm meeting up with a friend of mine um, named charlie who's a waterfall guide in alaska and in in um and then in california and we're going to go out duck hunting um, just outside of San Francisco for canvasbacks and greater scalp, which is a bluebill and, and golden eyes and some sea ducks. And um, this is this. These are images that I have to go and collect for some company work for a company that we're going to be working with. And they want some really cool imagery for their catalogs, for their social media. And they want real. They want soulful, real um, um meaningful images they want you know they they want somebody who's going to go and duck hunt and hold hold the dead duck and understand the relationship between predator and prey and and the biology of the duck the biology of the area that we're in and, and really kind of just collecting some of these images that are really going to move um their customers so there's a business element of it um but that is something that i'm just terribly looking forward to i was speaking to him yesterday and he said it's such a mash of city meets the wilderness. He said, sometimes we'll set up hunting canvasbacks. And he said, our boat is going to be up against a breaking wall that is literally covered in graffiti. <laughs> he said, so it's, so it's really, and he said, sometimes we'll set up next to an abandoned battleship that's parked in the harbor and just, you know, rotting away. And, and so he said, it's really cool to see these two images. And so I thought that was very interesting to me because you get the, this kind of city and then the country. And so, I mean, hunts that I'm really looking forward to are, are um, different white-tailed deer hunts, which I've already done so many times in North Dakota. Um, I'm trying to right now, trying to travel to the Arctic every year. I, I love it there. It's, I don't even like promoting it that much because I just, I, I, I love going there. It's just such a wild place, seeing the caribou, seeing the birds, seeing the, the redback voles scurrying along the ground and catching the fish and the weather and just the wide open space. It's, it's really amazing. But, you know, hunting moose and hunting black bears and, and um, you know, it's just literally about little excursions for me all over the United States, Canada, Central America, South America, Australia. I want to get back to Australia. Um, and just these are the places that I want to visit. Like I had some gentlemen, um, I actually spoke to them either right before or after you at the Western Hunt Expo. These guys that are from Australia and they want to they want to go to these outer islands that are super, super wild. And um, they have deer on them and some other species of uh, buffalo. And um, I really want to go back there. I have a good friend named Nick Joyce who has um, I've hunted with there in, in Australia and he's unbelievable guys super soulful we're very very connected it took us forever to um actually iron out the details of a hunt because i get offered a lot of free hunts and i um i've only done two i've only done it twice and it was it's never free it's always we're always um working with them to do different things but um i spoke with nick for three or four years before i agreed to actually go to australia and hunt with them and we finally had a phone conversation where we skyped and I realized that he was really soulful and cared for the animals much like like I do. And so he, I said, yeah, let's let's go and do this. And we did. And we've done it now twice. And, and we're going to do it some more. So these are hunts that, you know, I think of things like, 
farm ponds or big sloughs in South Dakota and North Dakota. And I think about hunting deer in Illinois and Wisconsin and, and um, uh, North Dakota and, and um, getting out West for, I, I'd love to hunt elk again and some more and, and do some mule deer hunts and things like this. And so these things are very, very inspiring to me to, to go and do, but it's way less about the animal perhaps that might be a lie. And it's far more about the environment, the animal that lives within that environment, and then my experience of hunting that animal. You know, it's it's seeing the areas that I want to see. Like for instance, this duck hunt in San Francisco. It's seeing where this city kind of smashes into the into the ocean and into this wilderness. I would really love to see those images. I'd love to see the inspirations that I draw from that. I'd love to see how ducks are utilizing these areas that are. Um, obviously hosting great impact from human beings. And so it's much more about the ducks, the habitat, the environment, the blending of them together, and then, and then going there and experiencing. Those are the things that I'm really looking forward to, along with hitting my little checklist of, you know, like hunting caribou is is um, unbelievable. Hunting moose is unbelievable. You know, like these are things, seeing grizzly bears, seeing wolves, like these are things that I'm going to chase for the rest of my life. It's so cool hearing you talk about this. Are, are you somebody who who dives into like meditation or connecting yourself with the universe or with the world? Or where is your stance? I guess maybe it's a, a religious question, a spirituality question. Because a lot of times, you know, when we're talking about hunter recruitment, hunter mentorship, connecting with ourselves, connecting with the wild, what mankind's true nature is a lot of it always goes to that spiritual aspect. You and I, we've also mentioned soul multiple times within this mm -hmm. episode. And so where, where is it that you lie in this regard? Because, you know, you take a life, it's a circle of life. It, you know, death brings life. It renews every year. Where's Donnie Vincent stand? That, I mean, you, you kind of just said it. That's where I stand. I kind of stand in the realm of, um, I've been asked before um, if I'm a spiritual man. Uh, I feel like my answer is no, but I also feel the, like I don't understand the question. I feel in, terribly connected to the things that I'm doing. I feel terribly rewarded when I'm immersed in these areas. So I know there's something. There's something that's speaking to me there. Um but I, I don't really understand what it means because I've, I've seen some images of people that consider themselves spiritual and I'm not that. And so I see um, the teas and I see the smokes and I see the, you know, um, rituals and I see, you know, and I hear different things. Um, I hear different things where, where people try to try to connect themselves through, you know, like they might go and talk to like a shaman or they might, you know, and so they might read a particular book to evoke like this emotion. And, and I don't do any of that. So that's why when, when I get asked if I'm spiritual, like quick and dirty is no, but I can tell you this, when I immerse myself into wild places, even if it's in my yard, right. Um, you know, one of those things like that quote that you mentioned in the beginning, fantastic things happen in fantastic places that, the fantastic places doesn't mean the Arctic Circle. The fantastic place is where you are enveloping yourself into the woods. and the, it, it can literally be your backyard. You can literally be hunting gray squirrels or casting your fly rod at a little tiny trout in a little mountain stream, and you're in a fantastic place. Like your truck might only be an hour away or 20 minutes away or 10 minutes away or 200 yards away. But you're in a fantastic place. You're looking at the stream. You're looking at the eddy. You are looking at the fish. You understand who he is. You understand what you're doing to try to catch that fish, shoot the squirrel, shoot a deer. Like fantastic places is, is where you're putting yourself that really have you connect with your soul, really have you speaking to who you are and feeling the weight of the world come off your shoulders and you you kind of get those goosebumps. You walk a little taller, you walk a little bit lighter in your step, but you feel impactful. Um, that's, that's where, that's where I live my life. Like I'm chasing, I'm chasing that. Man, 
That's beautiful. I love it. It reminds me of uh, there is a Hall of Fame uh, football coach from the state of Washington that coached at Pacific Lutheran University. His name's Frosty Westering. And I remember hearing him speak one time, and his big thing was make the big time where you're at. Make yeah. wherever you go, make that the big time. You don't have yeah. to, you know, obviously football coach. So, you know, playing in front of thousands and thousands of fans, like it, yeah. it's not about that. It's about making it the big time where you're at. Jana Waller, she always talks about, it's about living. I, I talk about knowing what you want and actually pursuing it and that mm-hmm. to, to find fulfillment in this life, you have to be your true authentic self. And that is where the glory of life comes from. Uh, mm-hmm. Man, I, I love it. You're inspiring me right now. You're, you're motivating me to just continue on being soulful, yeah. living it. Uh, I, I love it. So here's a question for you. You are, well, I, I, I told a couple people that I was recording with you beforehand. And I was yeah. like, hey, do you got any questions for, uh, for Donnie? And they said, yeah when are you going to be on the cover of GQ magazine so that we can uh, promote hunting that much more to the world? You are. Well, that, that, that's funny that you asked that because I'm writing an article this weekend. I'm writing a story for a woman's magazine that lives on the shelves in whole foods. I forget the name of the magazine, but it's, it's something along the lines of the Tracy Anderson magazine or Tracy something magazine. And literally literally it's it's a woman's fashion magazine i think <laughs> and so i'm i'm writing an art they reached out to me and i'm writing an essay for them for this weekend i'm writing it this weekend but it yeah it's due it's due on monday but i just found out about it this last week so <laughs> that is hilarious you yeah you and your twin now you may not actually physically look like each other but who's a better hunter but between you and Ryan Lampers. I feel like there's this this common bond between like the bearded gentlemen that are out there just making it happen. Do you know Ryan personally? No, I don't. I don't. Yeah, but I've heard I've heard stories. I've heard yeah, but I don't know him personally, but uh, I'll go ahead and and uh, for the ease of conversation I'll say he's the better hunter. <laughs> I love it. When I I think I actually spoke with him right before I ran into you at the Hunt Expo. Oh, sure. And my my buddy Clint, he was like, "Wow, hey, Donnie Vincent's more like that that GQ style of Ryan Lampers." I was like, "Okay, hey now." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. I'm sure I'm not going to be on the cover of GQ anytime. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is we laugh and joke about this, but the reach in which you have by getting into a woman's magazine or mm-hmm. doing these things it paints that picture and advocates for hunting that much more. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting. Like just for example, in the state of Washington right now, um, you can kill, you can, you, you can buy two bear tags a year here, but to hunt spring bear is a draw permit that you have to put in every year. Well, yeah. COVID bumped back the hunting seasons in the state of Washington. And now okay. uh, we have, animal rights activists filing lawsuits against the state of Washington saying because you bump back your hunting seasons and a lot of other reasons we're now filing lawsuits against you because you're now inhumane because you're hunting them outside of the originally scheduled seasons sure. um, it, it it just advocacy for hunting is so important and to have a reach whether intentional or not intentional that's the beauty of when you do things how you are, who you are, and stay true to it, that light shines even more. You uh, you come across this quite a bit? Yeah, and I think it's important, like, you know, for instance, when I'm writing for the films or writing for this article or whatever, I'm not just going to write it. I'm going to understand who the audience is. And even when I write for the films, I, I want hunters to come along on the journey as well. But even more so, I want the film to resonate with non-hunters or anti-hunters, even if it's just to warrant questions, right? To bring up questions, to have something to um, talk about and and um, something to learn about that they might not know about or something to challenge. Like if they want to challenge hunters, you know, th- I, I'm hoping that the films answer some of their questions and back their challenges down or at least 
evoke better questions within their within their challenge. And so, like, you know, the, the animal rights activists filing suit against the state. I mean, that stuff's just so silly. These, these are people that are um, the world has fallen so far from what human beings um, were meant to be. The, the world has changed so much. We've become so dependent on others to bring us food and shelter and safety. And, and that even lives truly in the, in the crisis that we're going through right now is that um, the mentality of human beings is to save everyone at all costs, give everyone as long of life as possible at all costs. When really that's not what we are as a species. We're a species that is to um, be prolific through working hard, through suffering, through challenging our bodies and our minds and finding our food and hunting our food. And, and um, you know, we lost a lot of this when, when with the advent of agriculture, we started staying in one place. We started having m more than one baby. We started having this population growth. We started having our excrement live in a single spot right next to where we are living. And so... Um, people like the the people that are filing that lawsuit they're they're good people but they're they're misguided they've lost their way as to what a human being is if you will roll into an eskimo village come with me to an eskimo village roll into an eskimo village and walk into the tribal council and say yeah i need to talk to the vegetarian in town i need to talk to the anti-hunter <laughs> in town they don't even know what you're talking about because their culture doesn't allow it because it's not that those people are shunned and pushed out. It's that there's no space for it because the way they live their life is the way that life needs to be lived. It's the way they live their life. It's how they're living it the most. They're truly alive. They're living, they're pushing They're and, and they're, they're better for it. And so like, you know, the people that are filing these lawsuits, you know, they live in apartments and they get their grocery stores from their, their groceries from a local co-op and they, and they 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 think they are reducing the footprint of man on this earth and they think that they're saving bears lives but they're killing bears they're ruining bear habitat and they're taking any value that the bear or the mountains that the bear lives on they're stripping those elements of value and so to where anything can come in because no one no one is going to be paying attention to those bears or those mountains as soon as the hunters leave and so as soon as that is, the resource management people are going to come in. They're going to start building houses. They're going to start stripping the timber. They're going to start stripping the resources. And the bears are going to hold no value. And it's it's it, we've seen it time and time again. They think they're saving the bears and really killing the bears. Yeah, and uh, You paint a really beautiful picture right there. I was talking with Robbie Kroger of Blood Origins. And I was mm -hmm. trying to wrap my head around this concept of, of African hunting. You know, being a school teacher, I am surrounded by a mindset that doesn't go along with the concept of hunting too often. Mm. And I'm sitting in uh, a, a conference room with a bunch of other teachers at lunchtime, and they're talking about Cecil the lion being shot and all this stuff, mm -hmm. and how dare people go, you know, kill these animals for sport or fun or whatever, and. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of biting my tongue because this was earlier on in my hunting career where I didn't actually understand or even have words sure. words to put to this. Mm -hmm. But Robbie, he said, we are putting value on an animal's life unlike any other person really wants to do. Uh, there was an auction for, I think, uh, some rhinos that were causing yep. some issues in, in Africa yep. and – they yep. said, okay, Black rhinos. yeah, you can, uh, we're going to put this up for auction. Whoever's the highest bidder can do whatever they want with the rhinos. And it provided mm -hmm. an opportunity for anti-hunting organizations to fork up the money to save the life of these animals. And they didn't step up, but who stepped yeah. up was hunters. And then we're the ones yep. that are, are willing to, you know, money makes the world go round. We're mm -hmm. the ones that actually step up behind that, that financial dollar. Um, mm -hmm. it's really interesting and i think us as hunters uh, we need to do our homework and understand the why we hunt so that we can mm -hmm. be an advocate and uh, a grounded stance for our communities to advocate for it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i was just um i was just shooting bows not that long ago with the gentleman that shot cecil the archer that shot him walt palmer he's a friend of mine from 
from Minneapolis and, and, um, he's an awesome dude. He's, you know, he's elder statesman and we were at the archery range and he's wearing a, you know, a sweater that you would see a professor wearing in a, in a library at a major university. And, and he's just in there just shooting his bow. And I didn't know he was going to be there. He didn't know that I was going to be there. Our, our both of our friends, John Schaefer owns a archery shop in Burnsville called Schaefer performance archery. And he opens up occasionally for us before the hours so we can go in there and shoot and, you know, talk to him about different things and, and Walt was in there. And so, but I was just, you know, I just had an opportunity. I hadn't seen him since that event and um, we didn't talk about it too much. We talked about it a little bit, but we mostly just talked about, you know, wildlife and being outside in the wilderness and, and um, bows. And he was just such an awesome guy. Man. Yeah. That, I, I love that. So here's a question I really have for you. You're a biologist. Yeah. You're also a hunter. Mm -hmm. They go hand mm -hmm. in hand and they, and I don't use the word should too often, but I really believe that biologists should hunt. They should fish that they should have an understanding of that. What is your take mm -hmm. on in the state of Washington? They're talking about reintroducing grizzly bears to the central cascades. You also have the wolf populations, uh, sprouting up all over the West as a biologist and a hunter. What, what is your take and position on all this? Well, it's, you know, so situational, right? Um, the West has changed vastly since those bears were extirpated out of those areas, right? They're not extinct. They're extirpated. We have forced them out of those areas. They've hunt, we've hunted them out of those areas. They no longer exist. The California grizzly bear, things like this. So to bring those things back to some of their original habitats and to reintroduce them and, and expand their territory where they're where they aren't already naturally expanding um, is probably not very fair to the grizzly bear um, or to the wolf. And, and uh, I've had some people ask me this question recently because they wanted to reintroduce wolves, I think, into Colorado. Mm -hmm. And um, and and I just think it's very, very difficult because Colorado is, you know, the face of Colorado, the face of Washington, California, wherever you're talking about. It doesn't even remotely appear like it did back then when grizzly bears and wolves thrived in these areas and the herds aren't there like they also were um, at those times and in these, in, in these areas. And so um, people have already done their damage. So to reintroduce the wolf and the grizzly bear, this is a grace. This is a gross overstatement. I don't really know any of the particulars like Washington. I don't really know if you guys have the wild untracked land that a grizzly bear needs to roam and to do his or her thing without having human intrusion because they're very unsuccessful. Grizzly bears really struggle when they're near people. They get killed for chasing dogs. They get killed for getting in garbage. They get killed for being too close to open hunting areas for people that aren't willing to travel into the wilderness where they live now and it's legal to hunt them. Um, so it, it really starts to, you're really dropping an animal into a, an instant conflict, right? You're dropping an animal into a place that's too overpopulated by people and it's likely going to start almost immediately um, having negative, negative engagements in these places. And so I don't know how I feel about it. Uh, I know there are too many people, this I know, and um, we've impacted this earth like no other species species ever has or likely ever will um, once we go through our next extinction or whatever it is that we're, we're trending towards. Um, but um, but I think it's going to be very difficult for biologists to release bears, to reintroduce bears, and to reintroduce wolves into anywhere that's other than the most wild and untouched wilderness that that we know of. And if we have areas like that, um, you know, then then either those bears already live there, or they could potentially be reintroduced to those areas. But it takes massive tracts of land. For these bears not to run into people and um and i think just doing anything else other than um giving them the ultimate room to roam in their area is is just it's not fair to them and um and it's going to create instant conflict right out of the gate yeah yeah that makes sense i, mean, I love uh the way you put that talking about it's <clears throat> the herds the the animals that they prey upon 
they're those numbers aren't like what they used to be. And so to add That's in right. another predator, another <laughs> uh, super predator, really into mm-hmm. that mix is is a dangerous combination to continue that wheel and cycle going forward. Yeah, it's not great for the ungulates, and it's really not great. Um, we as hunters always we always hang our hats on the ungulates and, and the prey animals that we utilize as well. But it's really not it's it's not great for the ungulates. It's a lot of pressure onto them, but it's also really really not great for the wolves and the grizzly bears. Right? They're gonna they're gonna suffer a fate that's that's um, because they're gonna they're either gonna run out of food or they're gonna run out of territory and reintroducing them to an area that doesn't have enough food and doesn't have enough territory. Well, you're just you're doing it probably more than more than not for a um for a press release yeah yeah I got and you. to appear and to appear like we're going in the right direction man it's interesting yeah everything is all about that mm-hmm. public perspective rather mm-hmm. you know i i talk often about opinion versus perspective and how often people confuse the two um opinion mm-hmm. being no real firsthand experience and then perspective like no i've actually gone through this and i know what it looks like um yes it, yeah it's a mistake that <laughs> often happens in life and wars can be started over it and it, it's a sad thing yeah yeah so yeah m- moving forward what does the future of of donnie vincent look like you know i bought rivers divide i i watched it i loved it i've shared it with a lot of people um but but what what do you want to accomplish? What does Donnie Vincent want to accomplish moving forward? Well, I definitely um, definitely want to make more films, right? We have four now. Um, before we're done, I'd love to have 10, 12, 15, whatever it is. And, and um, but I also have, I was just talking about this with, with our team. We have so much footage that we've shot over the years that didn't make it into films and that haven't been made into films yet um, that I really want to start releasing a lot of that content for free, just releasing it on YouTube and on our social channels, just so people can see the things that we've seen, the place that we've gone. Um, and just to increase that celebration in the conversation around wilderness and in the woods and, and wild places. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're just going to keep on working, man, like pushing Sigmanta growing Sigmanta um, with our client base and, and filming really, really, uh creative work for our clients we're working with a um an ammunition manufacturer out of texas uh called true velocity they make composite ammunition um i don't know if you've seen it i actually have some right here i i've heard about it and and that's amazing really interested in i actually i think i read your article did you write an article on it yeah and i'm i'm writing more stuff about it but here it is right here yeah see it and isn't that a former military guy that developed this yeah, it's it's not a former military guy. It's a guy that actually has never done anything with ammunition in his life, developed it, but he was a plastics expert. And some gun guys came to him and said, is this possible? And he said, yeah, anything's possible because he didn't know. <laughs> and so here's a 308 with a nozzler, ballistic tip, projectile. And uh, these guys are going to change the world uh, militarily, uh, law enforcement. And for hunters, they're, they're uh, unbelievable accuracy, unbelievable repeatability, uh, and the science that they are discovering is unbelievable. Every single time um, we dive into uh, the deeper folds of their research and the work that they've done with their scientists, it just absolutely blows me away. So this is one of our clients through Sigmanta, um, and then I'm going to shoot for them as well, do some work with them. But like you know, finding soulful stories to tell with these guys and finding the elements that really drive their business and, and, uh, and telling the truth, but also just really finding what, uh, the emotional connection between people and their ammunition. And they've done the most incredible background work, uh, to create this stuff. So anyway, but it's, it's finding stories like that for our clients and it's finding stories like that for ourselves. And just, um, I don't know what the future holds for me every day. is just as, uncertain and scary as the day before it seems and and so i just want to keep keep exploring i'm 46 now and and uh i mean i'll never stop yeah i mean you could give me all the money in the world and i have no interest in stopping i'd be sitting right here doing the exact same thing i'm doing right now it's so funny that in modern society and this goes back to the whole 
civilization, living close to each other, the city, life. The concept of retirement isn't something that has been around forever. You don't retire. Retire means like giving up, right? Surrendering to... Death sentence. Yeah, it's a death sentence. And a lot of people, when they retire, you know, they die <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so one of the things I th- it was beautiful to hear you say is like, Dude, I don't really plan on stopping. I'm going to just no. continue doing what I do, and it, it'll take care of itself. Yeah, I've hunted with a couple of guys that were. I've had a couple of my friends in their 40s say things along the lines of, yeah, yeah okay, let's go on a sheep hunt next year because you know it's probably my last year to be able to go on a sheep hunt. These guys are in their 40s. It's so upsetting to me. I just want to backhand them. I've hunted in... In, in the mountains and I've seen guys in camps that are in their seventies, mid seventies, trucking along the mountains, pushing themselves. And I just, that's living. That's the life to live. There isn't an age in which you suddenly get to give up. Once you get your girlfriend, it doesn't mean you stop going to the gym or stop training or stop hiking, stop going to the mountains. She, she might want you to do that, but then you know, you just cut that one free and move on and you just, you just keep going. You just keep going. Um, or vice versa. I, when I was in high school, I remember I was already going, planning on going and playing college football and college sports. And I remember being in the weight room with uh, one of my high school teammates. And I was like, Hey, do you plan on working out ever again after now that sports is over? And I was now looking back on myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, backhand multiple oh, times. Like, yeah, what yeah, are you, yeah. what are you thinking? But then yeah. again, that also shows that I had a lot of uh, learning and growing up to do. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's the beauty of it. It's like, you know, I'm not living with regret or even shame. It's, it's yeah. life. But for people to experience that is going to open yeah. up, open up the eyes and minds. And I want to hunt with my but, grandkids in the mountains. Yeah, the more we move our bodies, watch our nutrition, move our bodies, push heavy objects, push heavy weights around, or or weights in general. I don't mean heavy weights, hundreds of pounds, but just strong resistance in our bodies. Like, we are slowing our cellular decay by an untold amount. I mean, you literally, you want to, if you exercise and eat right and get outside without your cell phone, and take a look around. I don't care if you hunt. I don't care if you fish. I don't even care if you gather a mushroom. Just walk around. You do these things, and you are sitting in the fountain of youth. That's what you're doing. You are reversing, not reversing. You are slowing the degradation of your aging so much that you, you're just going to feel alive. And you do that all the way up until the airplane slams into the side of a mountain or your raft flips over on a sweeper or a grizzly bear finally has his way with you or your heart stops. You do that until then and you've won. Yeah, absolutely. I agree a hundred percent. It is, we use it or lose it, right? Being a PE teacher, I'm always telling kids, <laughs> yeah. I was like, listen, you have your body. And it's the greatest gift you've ever been given. Like if you don't use it, what's the point, you know? Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Man, okay, so th- this being the Soulful Hunter podcast, Donnie, getting into the soulful aspect of it, even though we've covered a lot of it so far, but what has hunting done for you? Like, and that's a big question, but like, hang your hat on it. What, what has it done? In, in one element, you know, it's put food on the table. If, if you want to look at it that way, that the, the storytelling that how I arrive at storytelling is almost always wrapped around hunting and fishing. So it's put food on my table. It's paid my mortgage It's paid uh, for the things that it is that we spend money on. So that's at the very basic level of food, water, shelter. It's, it's covered those bases in multiple different forms, right? Both in a caribou skin, the, the caribou's loins and, and hind quarters and front quarters and neck meat and, and, uh, and then also in, in my ability to uh, work with stories and tell stories and have people celebrate our work and, and engage. So it means the very it, it's providing the very basic essentials for me and multiple different levels. But um, the bigger aspect is it's 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 my life blood. It's my heartbeat. It's the reason I'm alive. Like you. you it. <laughs> 
when I'm leaving to go on a trip, coming home from a trip, getting ready to go on another trip, even looking at my gear, cutting a deer up, cutting a duck up, filling my bird feeders, glassing affiliated woodpeckers from my binoculars, uh, working the ground to plant grasses or to cut some trees down. Anytime I'm doing that stuff, it's literally breathing life into me. And, and, and that's, it's, it's, it's quite literally everything. I mean, the only other as, aspect in life is, is um, procreating, right? Which is all in line with this as well, but we are predators. There is prey. Unfortunately, we have evolved into having a massive population. We've evolved into having borders. We've inv- evolved into um, societies that have drummed up the most outlandish concepts of what we create wars over and what we create build fences for and and politics we're now governed for um and we're taken care of and so um but if you actually go outside you actually hunt you actually fish you actually gather or you just are walking around you will start to erode these things in our society that you don't need you don't need to be governed you don't need to be provided for. You can help and assist your neighbor. You you know, you can do this as a community without being told you have to do this stuff. And it will literally breathe life into your soul. Move your body, get outside, watch the sun up, come up, watch the sun go down. And don't run inside when it starts raining. Don't run inside when it starts snowing. Don't run inside when it gets windy. Um, go outside in the nighttime. I mean, literally go outside tonight. And lay in your front yard. I don't care if you, uh, tonight it's going to be negative one here. Go outside tonight, lay a down sink bag down or lay, tell your wife, honey, tonight, you and I and the kids for one minute, because otherwise everyone's going to start complaining. It's going to turn into a rat race (laughs) for one minute. Go outside tonight and lay the blanket down. If the sky is clear, drive out in the country, trespass if you have to. I'm giving you permission. Trespass into a farm field if you have to lay on your back, stare up at the stars. Take a minute and just look at the vastness of the sky. And when you return home, you'll be glad you did it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the grand, the grandness of this world, this universe, and yet we're all connected and we're all a part of it. And we play a critical role in it is the beauty of life. Yeah. The, yeah. the beauty of life. This has been a phenomenal episode. I've really enjoyed this conversation, Donnie. Well, oh, thank you. Me yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, in the Bible, it says iron sharpens iron. So the countenance of one friend to another. And even though we've only met a couple times, th- this is a friendship. And through what you are doing, through how you are showing up and everything, you sharpen. You're sharpening me. You're sharpening yourself. And it only allows us to be stronger and deeply rooted in our beliefs and, and how we feel about the world around us. So absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Powerful, man. We're changing lives. That's what the transformation through primal adventure is all about. I love it. It's a a soulful hunter. Let's go, baby. (laughs) Let's change the world. And it starts by (laughs) us taking care of ourselves and changing our own existence. So yeah, that's right. It's beautiful. Set by example. Yes. Okay, so Donnie, where can people find your uh, your content at? How can they connect with you? All that. Yeah, same places as everywhere. You know, Donnie Vincent, D O N N I E Vincent, B I N C E N T. Donnie underscore Vincent on Instagram. It's on Facebook. Um, DonnieVincent.com. Uh, I'm sure if you search it on YouTube, I'm pretty sure I have a YouTube channel that pops up. Uh, yep, you can find it in all these locations. Yep. I love it. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode with Donnie. And I know I have as well. And I really look forward to uh, continuing on the conversation with all of you. Guys, I want you to remember that life happens for you. It doesn't happen to you. And that we are in control of the existence that we create each and every day. Remember to freedom on. And as always, stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. 
To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com and be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful. Thank you.